Yeah. The last panel is super inspirational. Um, I came across them when I was putting out on social media about uh, pride in education and they contacted me and uh, could we please, could we please, I was like, I, I think Cody, I squeezed you at the last minute, didn't I? Yes. It was, yeah, I think so. I'm so grateful for it. No worries. It was absolutely brilliant. And you've done little bits through the Pride in Education conference, but I look at the work that you do and I'm like, no, 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 no. We need a full workshop on what you've been doing. So I'll let you introduce you and your team and maybe contextualize your organization, which countries you're in to help our audience online and here um, understand the fabulous work that you do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lila. We're really excited to see people in the room. It's been an all virtual space before this. So to be in the room with you is so thrilling. And we're thrilled to close out the fifth Pride in Education conference, the fifth one. That's huge. Um, so we're always so appreciative that you create this space where we can continue to talk about and center education and as a tool for creating inclusion on a global scale. So thank you, Lila. Um, I want to check something. Uh, Carrie is going to share a presentation. I just want to make sure Carrie has Zoom access. Brilliant. Yeah, we're using D10, which is a, a fantastic, fantastic platform. Um, it's a Zoom room, um, and it's just so easy. Like, can you tell us? Can you can you go around the room and the virtual room and introduce the people and tell us? Where are you dialing in from today? Yeah, we're going to get to that right after we do our, our community agreements. So okay. just wait one more minute, yeah. So this session is going to be facilitated and led by queer youth. On the next slide, you'll see that we want to set some community agreements to make sure we're on the same page before we do that introduction uh, in that way. Um, and set, it's really to list and set the practices of how we want to be and structure in this space. And if you want to add, as we're going through, please feel free to type it in the chat box. And, or if you're a person, you can raise your hand and I'm sure someone would be helpful in uh, running a mic. So the first one is setting this, community agreements is a safe space. We want this to be, create a safe space where people feel like they can share and that their contribution is valued. Um, going right off the last panel, listening and teaching with kindness, asking questions. It's such an important part of learning. The biggest rule of what's said here stays here, but what's learned here leaves here. And this is really about confidentiality as we respect information shared, but honoring keeping it in this safe space. We have the platinum rule, which is treating others as they want to be treated. For example, using their name, their pronouns, the boundaries as they express and affirm. Active participation. We are really excited to be here with you and we really encourage you to share and engage uh, openly and actively. And then seven of let's have fun because it's Pride Month and we're here to celebrate and this is our community space. So let's um, honor that and have joy in that. So if you are okay with these community agreements and if maybe if you're online, you could type in the chat box, okay? So that we know you're also there and you can see us and hear us. Uh, maybe in person you can give a thumbs up if there's any objections, feel free to let me know. Cool, I see some okays. <laughs> awesome, cool, okay. All right, I see a few okays. The next slide is introductions, now that we have those shared community space norms. So uh, if you're online, we want to know your name, where you're from, and why you chose to be here today. And while we're going around and sharing a bit about ourselves and introducing ourselves, we would love if you also do so in the chat box. So I'll start. My name is Cody Freeman. I'm the founder and CEO of the Global Center. And I'm here in Bangkok, Thailand. It's 11 p.m. Excited jazz to do this at a midnight session. And I'm here, I'm, <laughs> and I'm here today because I'm, I mean, honestly, I've committed my life to doing this work and helping LGBTI plus youth and being far away in Bangkok, but reading the news of what happened yesterday in the United States with the Supreme Court ruling has even further committed about how we need to create this community in order to grieve, in order to take action together. 
to reaffirm that our movements are parallel, that they're working together, they overlap. And so I'm really excited to be here today so that we can bring that raw energy into this space today. Uh, that's me. I'm going to pass the mic to Carrie for introductions. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Wilson, and I'm joining you from Buffalo, New York in the United States. Uh, it's only noon here, which is great because I don't know how it would fare if I was uh, giving this at midnight like Cody. Um, so I'm here today because I want to share a little bit of pure joy with you, a little bit of my experience, and this is actually my first panel discussion. So I'm really excited to be here and share with you and learn a little bit about everything that's happening. And so now I'm going to pass the mic to Dolly. Harry, the sound is really tinny. Is there anything we can do about your internet connection, maybe? You're not coming across clearly. We can hear you, but um, say hi. Sorry. I just turned my volume up. Is it any better? Yeah. yeah. OK. OK, sorry. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, so my name is Dolly. Um, I'm talking to you uh, from Tbilisi, Georgia right now, and it's my first time actually here to um, have online conference. I'm so honored to participate in that. It's such an amazing opportunity for me. Um, I'm from Egypt and I'm in Tbilisi, Georgia right now. And I'm here today to share with you some few of my experience and the challenges of queer Arab community in the Middle East or Swana region. And thank you so much. I'll pass the mic to Cody. Cool. So our session today is titled State of Education, Defining the Key Milestones, Best Practices, Gaps, and Strategies for LGBTI Inclusive Education. And the State of Education project was developed by the Global Center which is an NGO that transforms the world through education for LGBTI plus youth globally. And you'll see all of those fabulous faces in all these different countries and from all these different walks of life on that photo on the right. And at the Global Center, we really conceptualize education broadly because education is happening all around us. It's not just in schools and classrooms, it's in doctor's offices, it's in businesses and organizations, it's with families and homes, uh, with administrators and policymakers, really engaged stakeholders it takes to have this movement. And we've, uh, the Global Center only was legally registered for two years now, and now we have 31 people working across 16 countries. So you see, even during a global pandemic, the hunger, the tenacity of queer youth to really keep going, create and transform for a good future. And our goal is really freedom. We formed this community centered on this idea. Uh, we foster this space because the work is really personal. And it's not just about stopping hate crimes and bullying and safety, but about where also we want to go, the aspirations. And this is, I'm sure like many of us, like I grew up on a small rural farming town in Muncie, Indiana, and I didn't know we had a community. I didn't know we had a Pride Month. I didn't know that there was a space where we could belong that could support each other, but also the power of when we move forward together, that we can create some strong action. And that's the kind of conversation we wanna have in this space today. So let's start. So Carrie is going to share and zoom us into a little bit about state of education before we start our panel. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so thanks, Cody. The state of education report provides a global database on LGBTI key milestones and histories. So it also identifies best practices, sustainable strategies, gaps in policies, and programs through country level snapshots. Our goal is to map out the landscape of LGBTI inclusive education throughout the world. So the first step in doing that is knowing our past and present so that we can strategically move forward into the future. The State of Education Report can be used by researchers, academics, activists, and civil society organizations, but also, and what I think is most important, are policymakers at the national, regional, and international levels. The report can be utilized to learn best practices, provide recommendations on future law and policy, and serve as a bridge between academia, civil society, and the United Nations. So this is all in a continued effort to create a comprehensive and evidence-based impact. So our group, the Global Center, started on this in Egypt, and we're going to move across the Swana region. 
And the intention of this project is to map the entire world eventually. Hint, if you are a funder, we are still looking for a funding partner to help us with this initiative. So we should start a conversation. And since that provides a brief introduction to the state of education reports, I'm passing the mic back to Cody. Awesome. Thanks for that introduction, Carrie. Now we're going to dive into the panel discussion, but we want to queer the space a bit and make it participatory. So I'm going to have a series of like four questions, and I would love if you answer as well, whether you're online or if you want to in person. I'm sure someone's there would help us facilitate that, but we do want it to make it as participatory as possible and hear your response to the questions as well. Um, so the first question I have, I think, is the burning question. Uh, for Dolly and Carrie is, what is the state of education for LGBTI inclusive education in your country? And maybe I can start with Dolly. Thanks, Cody. Uh, so regarding the state of education in Egypt, it's um, it's very bad the situation because there is no um, inclusive education when it comes to LGBT plus community. There is no awareness, uh, but the activists trying to push um, and translating from English to Arabic and from other languages to Arabic uh, to build awareness and also the Global Center doing a great work like translating the translation team. Um, really doing great work translating from English to Arabic and um, like there are specific uh, terms that it's not existing in Arabic language but they are trying to really make um, something like similar respecting the language and the culture um, they are doing a great job and also the activists like see that the thing that they are doing it really means to me a lot as part of LGBT community um, thanks so much. And I'll pass the mic to Carrie. Thanks, Dolly. Uh, so yeah, like we said, um, I'm here in the United States and obviously we've even briefly touched on what was overturned yesterday. And as a young queer person, it's not great for the state of inclusive education. Um, my original answer to this question when I thought about it last week was talking about how there's this myth in California, New York State, which I'm in New York State, how we're progressive and inclusive when we have all of these rights, but it really comes down to a school district level micro analysis. I grew up in a very suburban area and we were actually the last high school in the county to establish a GSA. And that wasn't until 2018, which is the year that I graduated high school. So. Obviously the overarching theme is that there's currently an attack in the United States on uh, LGBTQ plus issues and the community as a whole, but it's not looking positive for inclusive education. And that's something I think that's really frustrating. It needs to be talked about and dispelled. And I'm gonna pass it back to Gobi. Yeah, and like the decentralization is so interesting because in Thailand, like where I'm sitting and living here for four years, how the education system set up is so centralized that the Ministry of Education controls. Um, really, the, the, the hot topics are about like uniform and hairstyle policies around gender expression, um, where so as like teachers will just cut, come up and cut the hair of students that it's too long or doesn't fit the like three or four prescribed hairstyles. You said the teacher comes and cut the hair. Yeah. There's like a disciplinary teacher that will just go in the class and monitor hairstyles and gender expression in this way. And more about, it's the philosophy of order and conformity um, and how that affects gender expression. Uh, another key issue is like bullying and harassment, mostly through cyberbullying and like group piling on online is a really big issue in Thailand. Um, and we're at the precipice of like maybe passing same-sex marriage. We've passed the first stage in the parliament. Now there's two more stages, but um, these big laws, such as what we were talking about in the States yesterday, like these impact directly the mental health of LGBT youth because they see the society they're going into and the fight that they're gonna have to do for equal recognition under the law and policy. So resonating with both of that. Um, and feel free to type in the chat box if you're online. 
second question, Kerry, first, what are the key milestones? I, so something I think is awesome about looking at the, the schedule for this conference is that there's so many LGBTI plus historians and trying to document the past, the present, how it's affecting our future. So how would you look at what are the key milestones of LGBT rights in the United States? So thinking about the milestones, I really think that there's three that stand out in my mind from what I've learned about. And while it may be correct or incorrect, we'll get to that later, uh, but the three key milestones that stick out to me are first and foremost, uh, the Stonewall riots that happened in New York City in 1969, June 28th, actually. So three days uh, from now. And the oh. patrons started fighting back and um, they lasted until July 3rd. And it's what we commonly think of as the spurring of the movement for gay rights in America. And then the second would probably be uh, Harvey Milk when he was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 1977, uh, because he became the first openly gay person elected in California. And this gave represent oops, excuse me, representation to the community during a time when it was facing uh, discrimination and intimidation. And really, there wasn't much that I can think of up until the Supreme Court um, ruled on the court case, um, Obergefell versus Hodges in 2015, which um, federalized gay marriage, uh, which is now being questioned, as we know. So those are really, I would almost argue that overturning Roe v. Wade yesterday is also a big step because it's going to lead to many more precedents. So it's history, whether we like it or not, in which case I'm going to change it to Dolly. Thanks so much, Kiri. Um, so when it comes to that part in my country, um, I can't say that we have like um, a key milestone or something physical that can recognize and we can talk about it that, yeah, we have that thing. So we achieved something that's like one of our achievements. Sadly, we don't have like some something like Stonewall, or I hope one day we have such something like that. But what we have right now, just a memory of people who are trying to just make peace, you know, just to stop the government from attacking LGBT community, pushing anti-LGBT laws. Um, so we have the memories of the activists, people who lost their lives. And I think we will like, we maybe have to work more. We, we are not like very open um, culture in when it comes to Egypt or in Swana region to talk about LGBT community because of the culture, the mindset, the people, the laws, everything. But when we see our history, Sadly, nobody talk about this in, in education in Egypt or in any country in Swana region. But when it comes to history, there are lots of amazing people in history, like when it comes to um, the old empire in Egypt, like the Pharaoh's empire, there were, there were lots of kings and queer kings like Hatshepsut um, and Hotep, many of them, if I talk about the history, I won't even finish talking about it because it it has like, we had amazing queer um, visibility and in the gender spectrum and starting from the Pharaoh's empire till Uthman empire till the modern history in Egypt, we have many actresses and actresses like, um, if I will talk about him, like we have like uh, the grandson of Omar Sharif, Hamid Snow, Hanan Tawil, and and many others. So I hope in the future we have something physical that I can talk about it. But I think we really have a big fight to to achieve these goals. Thank you so much. I'll pass the mic to Cody. It's so interesting to hear like how history is conceptualized differently in the different contexts of like events versus like people and memories and how we're defining that and how we're remembering that and how that affects the present and the future. But I really, I didn't know before this conversation about queer leadership and 
like queer royalty and how this is not a new thing in one of like the oldest civilizations in the world. Like this is not new, these topics. And I think it's often billed as such around the world. No? And the power of media as in representation as well. Um, with that, of how we're defining like key milestones and how we're remembering history, I do want to like really center and ask the question about who is often left out, who or what is often left out of how we remember, how we tell history. Um, whether that could be events and the milestones or through the people and social movements that are left out. And I'll ask, I'll ask Dolly first. Uh, thanks, Cody. Uh, so about that, yes, we have uh, like uh, left many activists talking about it. Talk, and we have also actress actresses from Egypt, from Swana region, who are talking about that kind of history, who are trying to push um, back to to just stand against the anti LGBT laws. But it's very a big fight and it's hard fight that we can win, but we will, it's a very long journey. And also individuals in social media, the underground community talking about it. Uh, in social media, using uh, social media variety of accounts with, with, of course, for their safety, they have to just follow specific rules and protocols. So because Sadly, there are surveillance against the LGBT community, even the individuals who are just trying to live and just trying to say it's not something new because the media in our country just always saying that it's something from the West, it's only Western culture, but it's not. We are here and we are talking about these things. Yeah. Can I ask Thank like, how, how is history being documented? How are you ensuring that like people's voices and stories are living on in Egypt? That's a great question. So um, as I mentioned, the activists and also there are lots of social media pages like LGBT in Arabic, Atiyaf, and many of them translating from English to Arabic and from French to Arabic. But here is, it's very a bit tricky because there are a lot of um, wrong uh, synonyms and, and topics they are translating from another language to our language, so it's not accurate, 100%. But they are trying to use the resources that are available online because we are learning our histories from other cultures, from, um, from activists in the United States of America or in other countries. We are learning that we had a history about that. We didn't know that before. Uh, so that was a very sad thing that we knew about it from other who are not from our culture yeah yeah would you mind sharing what you're doing with the podcast i think this is a really good initiative that deserves to be talked about yeah okay thank you uh yes yeah, so um i am doing a broadcast in or live stream um in online youtube channel and i'm just like trying to talk about LGBT plus community, uh, the issues and obstacles that they are facing in the Swana region, hosting individuals, activists, people, some of them choose to only uh, speak um, without showing their faces, some of them showing their faces, it's okay, it, it's up to them. And it's basically about their stories, their coming out stories, their struggle, how they feel, uh, how it feels like to be part of LGBT community in Saudi Arabia, or uh, how it, it feels like to be a lesbian woman in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt. So they are sharing their stories. They are talking about their experiences. So I believe it's it's not like something new because some of um, Arabs doing it, but I hope that many of us doing this. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you for that. And thanks for that initiative. Carrie, Thank you. passing the, the ball over to you, volleyball over to you, is what what or who is left out of how we remember our top history? In so United in the United States, like I said, I grew up uh, basically in the middle of the nowhere and we didn't learn anything at all about the LGBTQ plus community. We knew that 
there was a civil rights movement and we learned very little about that as well. So any knowledge that I had would have come from exclusively trying to educate myself. And for a long time, it was even hard to do that. Um, so everybody who's not a cis presenting white man, really, uh, trans women, trans men, people of color, um, disabled people, basically anybody that doesn't fit in the box of what's considered close to heteronormative um, is left out. And I actually did a little bit of research that thought would be interesting to share with everybody, some names that I researched uh, recently just to add to the contribution because like I said, my knowledge was limited. Um, like Audre Lorde, who was a black lesbian feminist, a poet, a, war a warrior, um, who made lasting contributions to the fields of feminist theory, critical race studies, queer theory. Uh, Barbara Jordan, who I actually didn't know was a civil rights leader and attorney, who was the first African-American elected to the Texas Senate in 1966. So going back to even before Stonewall and the first African-American woman elected to Congress in 1972 in Texas as well. And she won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, but like people like that, I would have loved to learn about that, hear about that in history. Andrea Jenkins, who made history in November of 2017, uh, when she was the first openly transgender Black woman elected to public office in the United States. And in January 2022, which was only six months ago, she was elected as the first transgender official in the United States to lead a city council. So. It's just a small sample, but I wish they would teach about that. I'm sure that none of the kids who went to my high school have ever even heard of these names or the people who were making history just six months ago. Um, so that's my answer. Every, a lot of people, too many people. Yeah, a, a follow up to that is when like, it, it's not in the formal curriculum. It wasn't in my school in Indiana. It's an abstinence only sex education state by law. You can get fired as a teacher if you don't if you teach outside that curriculum. When the, it's not in the formal curriculum, like how, for example, you did you learn about it? What spaces? What people? What websites? Books? Um, honestly, last week I googled iconic uh, queer disabled figures, and it was it was unfortunately challenging to find people mm. that fit the definition that were openly talking about it and sharing their experience. But when I did find people, I found people like Julian Gavino and Kay uh, Alinde Barrett. I hope I was saying that right. And they're both people who are disabled activists and they're both trans, I believe. And they were talking about intersectionality and the way that the feminism connects with those things and how their identities make them the person that they are. And I just think that if we had that in schools, it wouldn't be a negative thing. It would only be building people up in who they believe they are and how they embrace all of the parts about them. And I really feel like that's what's missing from the conversation. So everybody's thinking about, oh, this is negative. This is gonna push some kind of agenda when really it's just gonna make kids, like you said, feel like they belong, give them a community, give them a space. Yeah, which goes right into the last question quite really well of, then what recommendations do you have for creating a more inclusive LGBTI education? Uh, and let's start with Carrie, yeah. Okay, back again. So my first, I have two recommendations. As of last week, I only had one, but because of what happened yesterday, I have two and I think they're both important. Um, my first recommendation is to anybody who is in the United States of America, go out and protest and research who you're going to be voting for and make sure that you make that known and you let people know safely, obviously, that you're going to protest and do it as a group and make sure that they know that this is not going to be okay. I feel like there's so many other things happening in the world that it's really easy to forget that the youth is not going away anytime soon and we are passionate and we are emboldened and this honestly only makes me want to fight harder and more. And like you said, it's a fight that we didn't think we would be having, but honestly, I'm not going to give up and I'm not going to back down and they can't tell me what to do. So that's my first advice is if you are in the United States of America, 
use the power that you still have to your absolute advantage for as long as you can. And the second thing, and the one that's really close to my heart in another way is whether you're an ally or you identify in the community or you're an educator or however you may fit into the puzzle, you do fit and support each other. Just love each other and be a community and be there together. I have found in the Global Center the most amazing community, the most amazing support, the most transformative friendships I've ever had. Uh, like Cody said, we're global, so we've never even really met each other. Um, but over the past six months that I've even been like volunteering here, it has been an amazing experience. So just support each other and love each other and know that you're not alone. And I'm going to pass it to Dolly. Thanks, Gary. I really appreciate what you said. And I uh, want to just have only one comment before I answer that question. Um, I really support everything that you said, because I believe that it's a really hard fight in the United States of America, because after all these years, now they want to take everything. If that happened in Egypt, I think I would be mad also. Like, imagine if the same situation happened and we just like fought back. And after that, all our rights just being taken from us. I would be mad. I would just go out and break everything. Like, no, I, like, I know I can't understand the anger and it, it's very frustrating and I'm really sorry, but I hope everything just going very well in the next few days or weeks. <laughs> And um, answering this question um, about the recommendation do I have for creating more LGBT plus inclusive education. So the most thing that is building awareness and trying to, um, even if it's not available in schools or in health center in, in Swana region, at least in Egypt, um, because I'm not sure other countries like Tunisia or other countries in Swana region, but the most important thing that building awareness and um, having materials in in Arabic or a local language of the country to educate people about um, everything regarding um, when it comes to LGBT plus community um, about um, everything. For instance, how like how to do uh, or everything about. For instance, because I just noticed a lot of transgenders and transsexual community um, cannot have like their hormones or anything regarding their transition legally they have to do it illegally because it's it's not legal in in egypt even in yemen or any other country in swana region so at least affording those materials to be legally uh, for transgenders or transsexual that will be amazing because it, like being transgender it, it's hard to um, go through the transition so they have to go through um, illegal um, ways which put them in danger, uh, put their life, their health at risk. Um, and the second thing is uh, trying to, uh, like, for, for instance, the Global Center are really doing great, great job about translating and about doing survey right now for Swan Asian. I think it's very first time to have um, survey from actual individuals and um, people in Swana region from the LGBT plus community to talk about their stories, talk about their experience. And I think that's really amazing. And I, I hope in the future, like having um, such a wide and variety of data, that will be amazing in the future to, to focus and highlight the issues in, in LG, about the LGBT community in Swana region. Thanks. And I'll pass everything to Cody, hi. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing both of that. And yeah, we're about to launch our survey and interviews in the next two weeks. So we're really excited to this, you know, Egypt was the first country where attempting to document, but as you said, like that approach that needs to happen in like development work about engaging with like at the share, power sharing with communities, with people, co-creation um, and facilitation and support. Um, versus that kind of power over imperialistic model uh, links to like the um, colon anti-colonization movement as well. So thank you so much for these incredible contributions. It's always great to be in this space with you. Um, and now I just want to pause before we wrap up. If there's any questions, conversation, something sparked in people in the audience that they want to share. Does anyone have anything they want to share? Well, first of all, thank you.
This is really meaningful to me because I launched UK Queer Arabs last year and to have Ohti, Huna, Shukran Jazeeran, I'm so grateful because I know how difficult it is for people in the Middle East and North Africa who cannot be themselves. You mentioned the fact that they can't even be on camera in your podcast, yet there is an issue of safety, especially for the trans and non-binary people. They need to have the right information, otherwise their life is literally at risk because of who they are criminalizing the country, but also because of who they're affirming to be. Um, so I thank you because I know that you are taking a risk as well yourself by, by doing this work. And just acknowledge the activists around the world who are literally at risk every day just for being who they are. So the work that you do, Cody, and the fact that it's what, midnight now in Thailand? Yeah, no, that's yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, and then Rodney started at 2 a.m. I mean, the dedication of the people who have joined today is really moving.